Hello and welcome to a new Starting Conversation series brought to you by the New Mexico Humanities Council. Starting Conversations is a roundtable discussion series that explores history and culture in New Mexico and beyond. I'm Bethany Tabor, the host, and I'm very thrilled to be sharing this new series with the world, with all of you. Culture Springs from Food will explore the unique relationship between food and culture in New Mexico, bringing together voices including farmers, chefs, local experts, artists, historians, and academics, among others. We are so lucky to be partnering with an organization based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Three Sisters Kitchen. They are a nonprofit kitchen, cafe, and community space focused on nourishing communities through food, education, and public engagement. Our conversation today is moderated by Isha Aaron. Isha is the food storytelling programs manager at Three Sisters Kitchen, where she's working on Cooking for Generation, a project that cultivates new and emerging artists, celebrates the food traditions that define our communities, and builds a visual and audio archive of New Mexico food stories and practices. She is also an award-winning writer whose work focuses on entertainment, politics, and race. We are so, I'm so thrilled to have you, Isha. Thank you so much for moderating this conversation, and I'll let you take it from here. Um, thank you so much, Bethany. And on behalf of Three Sisters Kitchen, we're really excited to be partnering with the New Mexico Humanities Council on this series of conversations, diving into, yeah, the myriad of ways that food and culture interact um, in our previous discussion, here's the shameless plug, uh, we discussed cooking as archiving, and today's panel is all about food and power. So we're going to be exploring exactly how food gets from the farm to our plate, um, the indispensable but um, often invisible labor that makes that happen, and how we as consumers, both in a purchasing sense and also a literal eating sense, can support those who make all of this food possible. So I'll start off by introducing our panel. I'm so excited to host everybody here. Um, first, we have Anita Adelja. Anita has been farming for over a decade. She's worked on both nonprofit and production farms in Pennsylvania, Virginia, California, Washington, DC, and New Mexico. Before farming, she trained and worked as a social worker in New York City. She's deeply committed to increasing food access for all people as well as community building, financial security, and safety for farm workers and empowerment through food production and food sovereignty. She is the founder of Not Our Farm, um, of the Not Our Farm Project, and is a co-farmer at Ashokra Farms, a queer POC farming collective in Albuquerque. Um, welcome, Anita, and a quick question. Can you tell us a bit more about Not Our Farm and the voices that you aim to amplify through the project? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here today. Um, so the Not Our Farm project at its core is a storytelling project. So we work to amplify the voices of workers on farms that are not their own. So these are interns, apprentices, farm workers, farm managers, all laboring on farms, um, not, not business owners. And we're really trying to st strive away from what we typically see are the narrative of farming in America and who a farmer is or who we feel like we can call a farmer. So oftentimes we think of, you know, a white cis male farm owner and also think about like farming as tied to ownership and proprietorship. So what Not Our Farm does is at its core shares these stories of workers on farms, their celebrations, their joys, their hardships, and gets really gets to know who is actually laboring and producing the food that we're consuming. Um, this invisible workforce that you um, mentioned earlier. But in addition to that, we do advocacy um, for workers on farms. So through this, through hearing people's stories, what has come to be is we've learned about abuses that we often normalize in the name of farming. So whether this be, you know, not having access to time off or not having access to a bathroom, things like that. So, and working to the bone and just kind of these unsustainable practices in farming. So not our farm works to kind of, provide supports for workers, whether this be, you know, we created a worker zine so that people can be aware of what their rights are and how they can advocate for themselves and empower themselves to get farm jobs where they can really thrive. Um, in addition to, we are working on just different guides and different information and support for workers along the way, um, funding opportunities and things like that. Thank you. Um, our next panelist is Trish Gallegos, the catering coordinator at Three Sisters Kitchen. Um, food service is a passion she's been chasing for most of her life. 
In her professional career, Trish has had the opportunity to work in several fields such as accounting, community organizing, and being the proprietor of a cafe and catering company. Most recently, her work landed her a position with Three Sisters Kitchen, where she focuses on culinary creation, menu development, and catering. Food service and community organizing turned out to be her favorite jobs, and she now has the luxury of doing both in one job. Um, at this juncture in her life, she is happy to share her skills with the community. Uh, her passion for cooking and love of community have created the right set of circumstances for her to continue her work on social, economic, and food justice. Uh, Trish, question for you. As an organizer and as someone who ran your own business, um, what does it mean to have a food business that supports and protects workers in a holistic way? Well, uh, when I owned my cafe, I was the one and only employee. And I made this joke about this question earlier today with my <laughs> staff. And I was all, oh, I was horrible to myself. I treated myself as a bad employee. <laughs> and my daughter worked for me. She goes, what? You used to fire us all the time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's hard to remember that. But I think like the number one thing in creating a holistic and healthy way of having people work for you is you're remembering everybody is a human being, right? We all live lives and things happen in our lives, right? That are, that are beyond our control, right? And having the compassion and empathy to understand that and allow your employees to have opportunities to deal with their daily life stresses and, you know, providing a helping hand if that's what they need, right? Because we know that our biggest thing is like people get sick or somebody in their family gets sick or they have a car accident. And they're afraid to tell their boss, right? You know, I can't, um, I need some time off because they're going to hear no, or you can be replaced or what, find another job or whatever, right? So understanding that they live the same stress as we do, right? And being open to helping people out with that. And also, also my other thing is offering leadership development and personal development for your employees, I think creates pathways for better employees, right? And a little bit more like loyalty to you because they feel like you're invested in them as human beings beyond what they do for you labor wise, right? Whatever. Um, so, you know, providing those opportunities for them to pick up extra skills or le learn different parts of the organization that they normally wouldn't be a part of, right? In their per current position. And especially, I think that's like the most important thing with the jobs that don't offer like a lot of stepping stones within work, because there's some jobs where, you know, there's like three jobs, right? <laughs> you could do all three of those jobs, but it doesn't mean you're going to move up the ladder, right? So offering people those opportunities to learn other skills and learn other things, I think helps to create a better well-rounded employee, right? And helps to move these people out into the into the world, into other jobs, right? Is being like, that's how I got to where I am, right? Because I started out on the bottom. I have a degree in social work, but I chose to use that in community organizing as a, you know, out there in the field and doing that kind of work and not being like an actual social worker. Cause I knew that my capacity for burnout was gonna be really fast, but I knew that I had a lot to offer the community, right? And when working as a social worker, I learned other skills. I was an intern for like ever, an unpaid intern. I picked up on skills like catering. And that was where the, the creation of my catering company came from, was that somebody gave me an opportunity and said, hey, because I said, I think you guys are paying too much for catering and not getting what you're capable of getting, right? And they said, well, do you think you could do a better job? And I said, yeah, I think I could. So, you know, I took that on and that created the Dish by Trish Catering Company, which led to the opening of a cafe, but that didn't go very well. And then the pandemic hit, so that obviously didn't go very well. And I ended up here at Three Sisters, like right when, a few months before the pandemic started, right? And I was super excited to be here at Three Sisters Kitchen because yes, I was had the capacity to use all of those community organizing skills that I had massed, those social work skills that I had amassed, right? And the cooking and the capability to work in a kitchen, which interesting enough, I had never worked in a professional kitchen, even though I was a caterer and I owned a business. I, it all seemed to be like innate and I learned these skills as I went by and thank God I was like on the white check, but it was because I was given opportunities by different folks and learned these little things here and there, right? So creating that employee that's like, really well skilled and has a great toolbox to go anywhere, I think creates that really great holistic opportunity for people. And if I look down, it's because I have notes written down. 
um, yeah, that was pretty much as I, it is like just being conscious of people and, and, you know, life and what happens in life. And as an employer, being conscious of that and remembering that they have lives like we do, right? They're just, you know, they work here, you work there, but being conscious of that and then giving people opportunities to show you what they have, what skills they have and what skills they can address in multitudes of opportunities. But yeah, and I do love working at Three Sisters Kitchen. <laughs> me too. So you can see I'm, I'm the catering coordinator. You can see all my catering stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think you bring up a really interesting point, this sort of um, phrase of like, you can be replaced being sort of like, that's like hangs over people's heads and really, or in, like, intentionally, obviously by employers. Um, that's a really interesting point. Um, and to introduce our final panelist, we have Andrea Serrano from Olay, we're organizers in the land of enchantment. Andrea was born and raised in Albuquerque's neighborhood of Duranes. Um, has been working in the nonprofit and social justice space since 1999. Uh, Andrea's experience spans decades, including being a community educator at the Rape Crisis Center of Central New Mexico, a program coordinator at South Valley Academy, and extensive involvement in community organizing and activism with various organizations. Andrea began working at Olay in 2012 as a community organizer focused on BIPOC communities and urban conservation and helped stop the development of Albuquerque's Bosque, one of the only urban riparian forests in the U.S. Um, Andrea is now the executive director of the organization, leading the organization's political and electoral organizing work. Um, so a question for you, Andrea, is um, as one of Olay's focuses is on workers' rights, um, what sort of worker protections is Olay working on that is more specific to food industries? Thanks so much for um, having me here today. And, you know, one of our longest campaigns that began in 2015 was the fight for paid sick leave. And it was on the ballot in 2017 for Albuquerque. And then through some tricky maneuvering, um, it was placed on the back of the ballot. And so... It, it didn't pass by just, I think, 700 votes. But then we found out the day after the election, 6,000 people didn't vote on the back of the ballot. They didn't flip their ballot over. And it's one of those issues where, you know, the question always comes up, um, oh, but, you know, with sick leave, you know, workers are either just not going to come to work or they're, you know, what about this and what about that? There's always these questions, but what we never really get to is this question of what about the dignity of being able to stay home and take care of yourself if you're ill? What about being able to take care of your family members and not having to worry about whether or not you'll be able to pay your bills because you've missed a day's worth of wages? And, um, so when the question came up again in the state legislature, it was also, you know, the pandemic. And for the first time, the legislature was 100% was remote for uh, the public. So, you know, in the first committee hearing, I want to say there was over 100 people signed up to speak. And we had, you know, there were people who were calling in from their break uh, at work and they were whispering and they were like, I'm on my break, I have to make this quick but I really need you to pass paid sick leave. And they were like putting it all out there. And so passing paid sick leave in 2021, um, along with our partners and with our allies and champions in the legislature, and it's now gonna be implemented July 1st of this year. I think that is huge for especially people who work in um, food service industry. So, so often you hear of people who are, um, you know, servers who are sick, and uh, people who work in the kitchen who are sick and people who work in groceries stores who are sick because they can't afford to take the day off. And so this, this idea that we can't even allow people to take the, to, do, to be sick and without having to worry, um, we've heard heartbreaking stories over the years of people who have, you know, um, sent their kids to school sick, hoping that they could make it through the day so that they wouldn't have to pick them up because they also didn't have anywhere else to send them. And so, you know, when we, when you talk about this, this idea of worker justice, and when you talk about this idea of, you know, food justice, really it's also about what is, what is, what are the safeguards that are in place? And this, you know, 
we've, we've seen for decades now, employers have had the opportunity to offer sick leave on their own, and some of them do, and that's great, but not enough have, have offered sick leave to say, okay, folks are gonna self-regulate. It's the reason why we have safe kitchen regulations. It's the reason why we have a minimum wage because we know that not every employer is going to do the right thing automatically. Um, and so that's where, you know, organizing I think has been really important around worker issues and workers' rights, um, especially. And then when you look at who's working in, you know, uh, the food industry and when it, it, you know, oftentimes it's people of color and oftentimes they're not paid what they should be getting paid. And, you know, there, there's, there's small businesses and small restaurants who offer paid sick leave and who offer benefits and who, you know, take care of their employees. And then large chains are like, we can't afford it. We can't, you know, we can't afford it. Or there's this scare tactic of like, you know, your food is going to be now really expensive because we're having to offer sick leave when in all reality, it, you know, the, the cost of, of um, providing sick leave for an employee, I think the federal under like a federal guideline, I think it's something around 25 cents an hour per employee. Um, so if I have to pay a little bit more for food so that everyone can have paid sick leave, then, then that's a social justice issue. And I think that's how we have to look at these things. Um, you know, we have to look at protecting workers, not just as a workers' rights issue, but a, but a social justice issue. Thank you so much. Um, uh, before we jump into this, the rest of the conversation, I just wanted to read a quote that I think kind of both provides a thread between the three aspects of the food industry that you all sort of are representing in a way um, and, and really highlights what we're trying to get to at the bottom of this conversation or to get to the bottom of with this conversation. So the quote is from the Food Chain Workers Alliance and it is, around the globe, hundreds of millions of workers make it possible for the world to eat. Almost all the food we eat passes through the hands of workers who plant, harvest, process, transport, prepare, sell, and serve it. Labor is essential to our food system, yet workers throughout the food system are treated as disposable at every stage, while their labor and this exploitation remain invisible to many. Um, and there are so many invisible aspects of labor and service work from, uh, like you said, Amy, the bathroom access on farms to childcare, as you brought up, Andrea. Um, what are some of the invisibilities um, or other invisibilities that might come to mind um, for you? Um, would you like to start us off, Andrea? I think, you know, harassment of workers is immediately what comes to mind. Um, that, that's something that's always happened. Um, we, you know, servers have, have always had to put up with some sort of either physical harassment, sexual harassment, uh, verbal uh, abuse from customers. And then the pandemic exacerbated it because then you had people, you know, you had servers and hosts who were asking people to please wear a mask when they came into the business. And, you know, customers definitely just taking out all of their vitriol, all of their frustration, all of their anger about a mask. Um, on workers and they and and um, as someone who's worked in the food industry I, and, and anyone who's worked in food industry can tell you um, you know there's this idea that people have that they can talk to food service workers um, any just any which way they feel like and and be really um, ugly in a way that one they wouldn't do uh, to anybody else and they wouldn't do, and they wouldn't want it done to them. And so I think, um, and, 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 and I apologize, I don't have it right in front of me, but there's definitely um, news stories that came out during the pandemic of food service workers who were talking about the sexual harassment that they had faced and how not having patrons in the restaurant for that period of time when people weren't eating in restaurants um, you know, it, it gave that reprieve. It gave that little bit of a break. Um, but they also suffered for it because of tips. And that's the other part that we don't talk about is the tipped credit and eliminating the tipped credit 
So the tipped credit is basically in New Mexico, you get paid two thirteen an hour as a server outside of Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and Las Cruces because there's uh, different minimum wage um, laws in those municipalities. You get paid two thirteen an hour, and then you rely on tips. And there is there's no mandatory tipping. You know, if people don't feel like tipping, or if they feel like they only owe you a dollar or a quarter, um, and and this is now in twenty twenty two, then then you are not making any wages that hour. And, or, and so when people weren't eating in restaurants, the tipped credit didn't go up. Um, it stayed at that 213. And, and, and now we're in this place and I, I always find it comical when I hear people asking like, why don't people wanna work in the food industry anymore? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't good to begin with, but then during the pandemic, as a society, we really showed our worst selves to, uh, frontline essential workers, and then you want them to still stay in this job for the same crap pay. So, so I think that there's still, and 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 just to be clear, uh, in 2019, when the minimum statewide minimum wage was raised, initially there was a proposal to eliminate the tax credit and pay servers minimum, you know, the minimum wage, which and and index that, and there was so much resistance from business owners, from restaurant owners. And they were lying to their servers. They were saying, oh, you never, you can't get tips anymore without telling them that they would make that minimum wage. And so now that the minimum wage is $12 an hour, servers don't get that. And servers were showing up in Santa Fe begging, please don't get rid of the tip credit. I won't make any money without understanding like, no, you'll be making the same minimum wage. And so it's, it's the manipulation and also just this idea that tips are gonna magically supplement what servers make per hour. And that isn't always the case. And it absolutely wasn't the case during the pandemic. Um, Anita, would you like to um, also, sorry, <laughs> let me find this question about speaking to the um, invisibilities in your particular industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so much of what everyone is saying is really resonating with me. One of the biggest invisibilities, I think, in agriculture that's not, I don't think, necessarily known by a day-to-day -day consumer is that a lot of the laws, like minimum wage law, paid sick leave, those, there's exemptions in agriculture, so they don't apply. So we have farms here in New Mexico that are paying workers, you know, by the bucket down south with chili pickers, but also here in Albuquerque, $5 an hour, um, and that's the norm. And same with OSHA, OSHA um, standards for safety. If your business is less than 20 employees, I believe OSHA standards don't apply either. So there's so much like unsafe um, work that's happening that's kind of going under the radar. And then kind of bringing it back to, I feel like I will die on the mountain of bathrooms on farms. Um, it's one thing that's really interesting to note. So with large farms, so say your big farms in Florida and California, often these farms, not often, more, more so than not are subject to, you know, FDA um, inspections. So Federal Drug Administration, um, FISMA Food Safety Modernization Act, like they'll get inspected for that or any kind of like USDA audits, things like that, because they're large enough that food safety concerns they can have a huge impact, right? So because they get those inspections, you're going to see porta potties there. You're going to see like designated areas for people to eat lunch. And if they if they aren't there, they're going to get fined. Um, not to say other harms don't happen on these large farms, but when it comes to small scale farms, say you know here in New Mexico, so many of those fall under that radar, which is I think it's about twenty five thousand dollars more or less. You have to be making if you don't make more than that, then it's um, you have different sub like states of regulation. So some of our farms are usually like mid-level, so they're not getting these regular inspections. So having access to a bathroom, whether this be a composting toilet or a porta potty, is it's actually you know the norm. I can tell you in the 12 years that I've farmed, I think I've worked on one farm where I had access to a bathroom. Now what comes with this is, you know, it's not just you know having a place for comfort to use the restroom, but as a menstruating body. Um, working with predominantly male crew members. I mean, where's the dignity there? Where's the safety there? And then taking that even further, if you're producing food for vulnerable co communities or anybody, nobody wants to risk, you know, the food safety too with the produce that you're producing. So those are big, big invisible issues that I think people aren't aware of. And then 
I'll go in a step further. I think a lot of um, when we talk about internship models on farms, right? I think what people generally think is, okay, this is like an apprenticeship model, an internship model where you're gaining these skills, you're learning from these master farmers and you can then take that knowledge on and start your own farm. And that can kind of, I feel like a lot of folks justify the small wages for that. And I will say firsthand that internship models are total exploitation based on enslavement practices, especially in agriculture. And there is no way working on a farm for multiple reasons that you'll then be able to start your own farm. Because the truth of the matter is you can learn, you know, you're, there's knowledge hoarding that happens on farms kind of on a need to know basis, whether the farm owner wants to kind of take part in knowledge hoarding or if it's just this sense of urgency and you need, need to know basis and maybe you're good at picking strawberries. So that's all you do and you're not seeing other aspects of the farming operation. So you're not learning all these skills that you need to learn to then start your own operation. That's the first thing. The second thing is if you're being paid these wages, where are you built? How are you building capital? I mean, it takes how much money does it take to start a farm? What kind of infrastructure do you need? Land access, all of these different things. So it's kind of this you're in this like cycle or the circle that you can't really escape from. And then third, farming, you're literally using your body, your physical body to build other people's businesses. Like I, I farm in the over a decade that I farm, those were the best physical years of my life. And only now at the age of I'm going to be 40 this year. Am I able to start a farming business with a collective of three others? And we're, I mean, we're barely getting by, but I mean, it took that long of kind of just trying to build to get to that. And who knows if we'll even make it, but um, yeah. So I think there's a lot of myths in this whole idea. And I think a lot of folks want to cling to that. And it's like this model that makes people feel good at the farmer's market, supporting their farms, but there's a lot of stuff that's happening behind the scenes um, that are very abusive and very exploitative. Um, I think the word myth is like really powerful because there is a lot of myth making from across industries of like the labor that goes into food. Um, uh, Trish, is there anything you'd like to add from your point of view of sort of the invisible aspects that people don't really think about when they think about a restaurant or food industries? Yeah, so like the one that came to my mind when I saw this question was the instability that's in in both, right, <clears throat> in the food service industry and the ag business, is that there is inconsistencies in work and stability, like in your work hours, right? So working in the restaurant industry, it's like, <clears throat> oh, we have too many employees here. Uh, you can go home. So you never <clears throat> know if you're actually going to work truly a fully 40 hour week, right, that week. Same thing happens in agriculture. <clears throat> You don't know, you can go one day and it can be raining, so there's no picking today, right? Or, you know, something went wrong or there's too many people or blah, blah, blah. So there's these inconsistencies in wages that occur within both industries that make it hard. <clears throat> and the same question that Andrea had mentioned, how people say, why don't people want to work in the restaurant industry? That's part of it. It's a very unstable business, agriculture as well. So how do you, like, you can't, like plan your life or build equity or do any of those things when your life in that, <clears throat> if that's your particular skill set, leads you to that industry and you don't have a stable income, right? Um, that makes it hard. That's one of the, in, in the invisible things that I recognized with that question is that, yeah, where your life can't be consistent or, you know, stable when you work in either one of those industries, unfortunately or you're overworked and that doesn't work either, right? They've got you working 60 hours a week for this set amount of pay, which means you're not actually making that beautiful hourly wage you think you're making because they're exploiting those extra hours and that doesn't work out either. So yeah, that was one of the ones I saw that, that really touched me on that one. And not because I worked in either industry, but I've been a part of either industry some way or shape, um, yeah. That one is a big one for me because you can't have a stable life. I don't know what I'm going to make this week. I can't plan anything, right? Yeah. I think that there, your point about overworking being a form of instability in and of itself is sort of something that we don't really think about, but it definitely is. Um, and you've all like touched on sort of how gender plays a role, but um, I'm going to ask anyway about how gender and and other sort of intersections of identity 
um, yeah, gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, how those also kind of intersect with the general um, sort of imbalances of power in these labors, if anybody would like to speak to that. I can jump in here um, in terms of farming. I would say, I mean, I talked about it a little earlier on with, you know, who is typically, who has access, right? It's a question of access. Who has access to land, capital, resources, knowledge. Um, and in this country, it's been typically white men who have that. So you see that in who owns land, who owns farming operations. Um, so as a worker working on these operations, if you aren't a white man, you know, you're going, it goes without saying, like you're going to experience sexual harassment. You're going to experience um, kind of, all sorts, all sorts of the isms, right? And especially I, I can speak to, you know, queer people of color working on farms. I think something that's not often talked about is that <clears throat> you don't necessarily, like a lot of farms are in rural areas, right? Where land is plentiful. And oftentimes there's a lot of that, that mindset there might be more conservative or racist or un just purely unsafe, right? So when that happens as a queer POC, you don't have the ability to then go and work on these, it limits where you have access to and where you have access to learn, where you have access to work um, and whether or not you wanna risk your safety for that. So I think that's a big question that people have to ask themselves when they are taking jobs on farms, especially if they don't fall into that majority, you know, white male um, area. And I also think classism is a huge thing that happens on farms as well. Um, again, like with the access issue and also this really terrible kind of um, assumption of you not know. I feel like one of the biggest things on farms as a worker is that people think if you're not an owner, you don't know anything or that you're not smart or that it's brunt labor. Or you're just doing this brute labor, right? That doesn't require thought or intelligence, which is so far from the truth. And I think workers get it on both ends. They get it on society thinking that right no one wants to see a dirty farmer showing up at the coffee shop or whatever um or has their own like ideas about who is growing that food but then also on the farm owner's side they are thinking the same thing about you as a worker so I think workers see it on both ends too when it comes to that um so yeah I think there's like tremendous like it's just it's a struggle for sure I mean, I think in the restaurant industry, there's there's definitely hierarchies as to who's in the kitchen and predominantly, which is really interesting, predominantly restaurants are male operated, right? And the chefs, lead chefs, head chefs are usually always men, right? And, and women get stuck with, you know, the sous chef or the cute hostess in the front or whatever the deal may be. Uh, but yeah, definitely specific gender role ideas right and divisions of labor based on gender right who gets to do those big jobs because women can't handle that kind of stuff right so there's there's definitely that i had now i have seen that not just not as like working because fortunately i don't work in that kind of restaurant uh but i have seen it <clears throat> and you can see that women are pushed aside in those bigger better roles tend to go to men right and those bigger paying roles tend to go to men because women don't need those roles. They probably have a partner supporting them or some you know, crazy thought process like that, right? Um, so you see those divisions of labor based on gender in all industries, I think, or like across the board. But yeah, that, I mean, that's, there's obviously been a significant note around men getting paid more than women all the time. And it's based on some of that crazy thought process that we're incapable of, you know, doing things that men do <laughs> which is very false <laughs> um i i echo both sentiments um from from both trish and um anita and i think just to add to that when you also look at who um who who's in the fight for uh, worker justice and food justice, oftentimes it you know it's it's women, um, it's women of color, and it's families, and oftentimes that's 
sort of shoved aside. I think something that comes, the question that's always comes up is when, whenever you talk about anything that's gonna be uh, remotely close to workers' rights, the immediate first question is always, well, what about business owners? And it's very rarely is anyone asking what about workers? And no one is asking um, what about women who are, who are working in this industry? Um, and so, you know, and that isn't to say that um, across genders, right? I think we have to look at worker justice and, and who's being exploited in, in work and who works in the kitchens and, you know, um, who gets to have any kind of visibility or voice. But I think that when, when, when you look at how people are shut down um, and who isn't getting paid, you know, there is definitely, there's a race lens to that and there's also a gender lens to that. And I, I think it only makes our movement stronger when we have those conversations and we talk about them instead of sort of just trying to gloss it over or making it very like, I, there's, there's a push to make the rhetoric always just very business friendly, very safe. And, and the reality is the other, you know, anytime worker justice, worker rights come up, the opposition is brutal in the way they talk about workers. You know, um, the, the opposition will, will paint workers as just these like deviants who are just out to cheat the system and we can't give them anything, any kind of benefit because they're just going to exploit and they, and the reality is um you earn one hour of paid sick leave for every 30 hours that you work that's with the ordinance that's going to go into effect on july 1st and so by the time you even earn the eight hours and a lot of food workers food industry workers don't work full eight hour shifts so you're earning you know enough to cover a four hour shift or a six hour shift um, but it, it takes weeks to earn that. It takes, you know, every 30 hours that you're working. And so just even this idea that, you know, someone is going to somehow live off of their sick leave and make it, you know, strike it rich off of sick leave. It's just, it's such a, it's, it's funny when you're saying it, but I can tell you how many times I've been so infuriated sitting in city council meetings and county commission meetings and sitting through state legislative hearings where you're hearing not only business owners, but also lawmakers who, who just sort of have this rhetoric. It's, it's so disappointing uh, how little we think of workers in our society. For, except for like that blip where, you know, over the loudspeaker at the grocery store, they were thanking workers or these like little, you know, banging pots and pans out the window in New York City to thank essential workers. Um, except for that blip in time, it very quickly went back to um, demonizing workers. Um, just to get this right, if you're working one hour, or sorry, if you're earning one hour of sick leave for every 30 hours to get an eight hour a day, that's 240 hours of work. Okay, just wanted to make that clear. Got it. Wow. Okay. Yeah, so um, it's essentially what I think how many weeks of work I never did I never get the math in my head quick enough it's weeks and weeks of work and it's five or six weeks of work to it's even eight earn weeks. it's eight, eight weeks thank so you. it's like every two months yeah you are in one eight. day so and on average workers typically don't take more than two to three sick days a year like that's study after study after study has shown that and even studies done by um UNM by the um it's called Bieber um, within UNM. They do a lot of this kind of research and uh, economic research. And they even showed like, this is something that's actually benefits business owners, but, but you know, it, it, facts don't matter to folks in, in this like rhetoric around, and it's always workers who catch the, the, the brunt of, of, you know, all of this just really harmful and hateful rhetoric when it comes to just doing right by workers. And the pandemic really threw that off because God forbid you were exposed to COVID or you got COVID and you had no sick leave. What did you do? Because it was a general 10 day stay when you have COVID, right? Or have been exposed five to 10 days, unpaid. So many people have suffered tremendously because of that. 
I'm really curious um, when you're talking about why aren't we thinking of the workers? Why aren't we thinking of the women? Why aren't we thinking of people who are the most exploited? When we think about food, even if you are like thinking about organic food and local foods, like people think about like the soil quality or the type of oil that was used to like prepare the food. And like, we think about whether or not the chicken that we're going to eat had like a good life or not, but we don't ever think about the work. It's not part of this conversation. And I'm so curious um, why you think that is and what are ways that we can get people to regularly consider the human aspect of this immense labor that goes into getting food to people. I can start, I couldn't find my mute button, sorry. Um, Well, I think for me, the answer is simple. I think the worker has been, at least in agriculture, has been erased. If you look at kind of the history of agriculture based and enslavement practices, you had the farm owner and then you had this enslaved people working on the farms and that has carried forward. So right now, who do we kind of venerate? We venerate the farm owners. When we think about who we need to support, who needs funding, who needs, you know, access to things, grants and stuff like that, it's always going to the farm owners. And <clears throat> so that invisibility has carried forward. And when we think about you know, in terms of like what you were talking about with sustainability and soil health and, you know, regenerative agriculture, we don't talk about the sustainability of the labor, which is such the essential force in the heart of the operation of any farm operation. And it's a shame. And it, and I think that's what it's rooted in truly, um, that invisibility and that um, history of agriculture that we need to face and we need to talk about. Um, but I would say that there are some There are some great projects out there that are seeking to kind of elevate workers and in terms of like certification. So on a consumer level with folks paying, kind of voting with their dollar or like supporting things with their dollar. So there's a a certification through the agricultural justice project that's called food justice certified. And it's kind of the next step of the organic standard. It's like going beyond food to how are you treating your workers? Are you paying them a fair wage? Do they have access to certain things? They kind of have this checklist and farms certify farms. And it's a label that will be on your produce. So you can see like, okay, I'm supporting, you know, this farm is practicing good soil health. They're not spraying their their, um, produce. And they're also treating their workers in a way that, you know, is something that I can I can support and rally behind. And I think it's extra dangerous with agriculture because we don't have those government protection, those government safeguards. So we do have to rely on the owners or these kinds of outside third party certifications to ensure that workers are being treated well. So that's one that I think that kind of gives me hope. Um, unfortunately, it's not gaining a lot of traction with consumers. Um, Right now, I think only one co-op in the country is accepting food justice certified, and that's a co-op in Ithaca, New York. So that's something that I really want to push some support around, and that's something that our farm intends to to get that certification label just as a model, hopefully in New Mexico. But um, I think it also needs to come from a place of educating consumers to ask questions. So, you know, consumers and vendors, who are you sourcing from? Ask, you know, what are beyond their growing practices, how are they treating the labor on their farm? And these are fair questions that we all should be asking if we're supporting with our, we ask the questions about, you know, spraying chemicals and organic and all of that. Like this is not a taboo subject. This is an essential subject. And we, we owe it to workers to be asking those questions. I think um, it's a societal shift that has to happen as well. And I, 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 I'm really grateful for the perspective of um, farms and farm workers because my, my perspective is often just on food industry in terms of restaurants and um, stores and just, but this idea that you're here to serve me and that's it, right? And that comes from both the own, the business owner and the consumer. There's just this idea of you're here to work for me and you're here to serve me. And without any sort of um, care or concern. And so there, there definitely has to be that, that shift, that mindset shift. And it's also, um, 
you know, there, there were certain restaurants, I won't name names, but there were certain, just scroll through Olay's old, old Facebook posts, where there were restaurants who were flat out protesting the governor's um, orders. And, and this was at the beginning of the pandemic. There was no vaccine. No one knew what this, what this, no one knew what COVID was. We just knew it was really dangerous. And so there were safeguards and there were um, certain restaurants who were defying orders, who were staying open anyway, who um, were doing these online protests and they were supported by, you know, their own kind of like business coalition type uh, restaurant association and, and being, you know, sort of really blatantly like let us serve and putting their servers out there with this protest signs. And, and we had to ask ourselves, how many of these servers are doing this willingly? And how many are feeling the pressure because they're not gonna have any other source of income. So they're willing to risk their wealth their their well being and safety and health um, because they're they're feeling the squeeze right and so I think that you know I I haven't gone back to those restaurants some of them were restaurants I really enjoyed or that were really convenient and close to the office or close to my home I won't go back I won't go back there's a, there's another really popular New Mexican restaurant that fought tooth and nail against paid sick leave from the beginning in 2015. I haven't eaten there in seven years because, um, and, and so I think we also, you know, need to really be cognizant of not only how is a business treating its employees, but how are they showing up in terms of supporting uh, any kind of, or, or fighting against ordinances, and mandates that are meant to protect workers. If they're showing up against, you know, then don't spend your money there. It's, it's it, you know, it's really, it's, there are like 10,000 New Mexican restaurants to go to. You don't have to go to that one, especially when they don't support their workers. So I wanna approach this from working for an organization, Nonprofit Kitchen, that is trying to create these shifts within the restaurant industry, right? So us being conscious of who we do business with as well, right? And then trying to also model good working practices, right? We get paid well, we get paid better than a living wage, we get full benefits, we don't accept tips, but if you want to leave us a donation, those donations are to used to the benefit of the employee. Those are to pay for our, our health benefits, right? that's where the tipping goes we don't share tips we get paid well enough we don't need to do that but if people want to contribute it goes to our daily operating places right and then our connections with who we purchase produce from right which farms are we selecting in albuquerque to add to our products right and to to you know sustain us through all of this to make sure that we are working with farms that are also treating their employees and that are also like mission driven, like we are, right? Thinking about what it is uh, we want to do to make sure that we as employees are being treated well and that the folks that are receiving what we give, our food products, are, are getting the best products out there, right? Um, that's part of what Three Sisters does. It's part of the reason I'm like pretty happy to be working here and, you know, proud to be using my skills from all my different jobs to be here because it is a place that models a really good working practice for its employees and all of its staff, right? Um, so we know we're taken care of, we get paid sick leave, the COVID happened, uh, you know, Anzia stepped right in and the board of directors and created an extra paid sick leave for COVID that addressed those COVID issues. If somebody in the office got exposed and we all had to be off, we were okay, we were gonna be paid, right? I don't know how many other restaurants do that, right? But uh, I mean, <clears throat> granted we're nonprofit, so we receive funding from other places to keep us running. But I think for the most part, when the cafe was open, all those practices of no tipping and all that, and then paying a living wage was not like killing us, right? And so it's possible. So trying to show other restaurants that yes, it's totally feasible that you can do this. And there are several restaurants in Albuquerque that have now taken to the no tipping movement, right? Not taking tips 
and doing those kind of things to into offering the paid sick leave and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm part of, I think other, like, again, like what Andrea said, it, it is very societally driven about the invisibility of the people in the back of the kitchen that actually made your food. And there's always this trend to like, just acknowledge the chef in the kitchen because, oh, they created this great food when it, that's not really always the case, right? They're at the head of the thing, but I mean, it's usually a teamwork thing and they're not generally making everybody's plate. They're giving orders back here. <laughs> But I mean, it's generally the rest of the staff. And how do you do that? We highlight all the farms. So when we do a catering, when the cafe is open, we're acknowledging every farm that we get produce and food from, right? Um, another way that we've talked about, because we talk about it all the time, how do we highlight everybody that works at the, even the dishwasher, you know, whoever it is. And maybe that's just by putting out little storyboards out in the cafe, right? or having TV cameras that will highlight, yo, this is who put your plate together and this is who washed your plate, <laughs> or, you know, or those kind of things, but highlighting all of the staff so that everybody knows who's working there and who's doing what and how many hands go into making your food, right? It's not just, I want to order that burrito. Oh, well, yeah, that's really cool, but how many people are actually going to make your burrito or involved in that, right? So, I mean, that's something that we think about and I think that modeling those kind of things in our cafe has helped to shift a little bit of that trend. But I mean, that's a hard one to overcome. It's, you know, it's been a long time thing that people don't think about who's back there or who's picking your produce, you know, who's picking your lettuce, you know, and then this whole, <laughs> sorry, I get a little bit bitter about vegans, but I'm going to put this out there. This whole trend towards veganism, right? I mean, I get it. Yeah. I mean, it's a healthy lifestyle and all that. But have you thought of the impacts? No, and people don't think of the impacts on the farms, right? How many more people do they have to employ now, right? How much more land do we have to occupy? And can the land actually, what can the land offer you? I mean, we have to be conscious of what can any of these particular pieces of land actually offer the land itself offer up to grow, right? Because not everything will work everywhere, right? And so like people aren't thinking about those impacts, how many more workers it takes, right? And how many more hands have to touch your produce to get it from the farm to your table? And what is that doing to these poor people working in this industry that are already being exploited badly? And then we're just adding more pressure to the exploitation, right? I don't know. Conversations with everybody who walks into the restaurant. Hey, you're going to order that? Guess who's going to make that for you? Stuff like that, I guess. I don't know. We talk about it all the time and it's just always a, a conundrum about how do you uplift everybody that works in your place and make that a conscious thought of people eating food. The pandemic did a really big shift, I think, on people's thoughts and ideas about restaurants and the, the whole, I'm so hurt because I can't go eat at so-and-so's because there's a pandemic. Um, and then creating this whole carry out, take out, you know, you don't have to see or touch anybody really created a, a, I mean, even a bigger barrier there about who's doing your food because now there's like no contact. It's like you just get on an app and order your food and now you have no personal connection, right? I mean, we're getting back to that in-person thing, but how again does a restaurant highlight who's staff? and who's doing what, and especially now that we no longer have to have personal contact with you. I don't know. I don't know. Yearbooks. <laughs> Every cafe should have a yearbook of who works there. <laughs> and the consumers have to sign it and say, oh, you voted the best whatever for this year. Good luck next year. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Something on the menus, maybe. Um, the uh, idea that we are all ordering delivery more also brings in as we're looking at these sort of interlocking ecosystems of food industry is sort of like the like delivery people who are getting the food from point A to point B and where they lie in both like where their labor lies and how like the sort of these like I, whether they're gig workers they work for the restaurant sort of like how like who is also looking out for them and supporting them um, I think you bring up a really good point when you said people aren't necessarily conscious or having conscious thought while they're eating because it is a really, it can be a really passive activity that you do, or it really just like 
depends on how much you want to bring to considering what you're eating um, and considering the people that made it. Um, and yeah, I'm always interested in, in sometimes that's the point you eat to escape and sometimes the, you eat to like enjoy exactly where you are and where the food came from. Um, so yeah, I think this idea of like a societal shift of getting more just conscious of what we're eating is hopefully happening. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate all of you for like, for your thoughts today for, um, just I've been having a lot of like revelations about eating practices and and how and and worker practices. Um, I guess one last question might be um, like who is doing this well? Like who and like what resources or what stories do you look to when you think about things changing in a positive way? I, well, you just heard me give the giant spiel about TSK. So I want to say we're doing it well and we're not even quite there yet. But I mean, we continue to talk and navigate around all of these topics. I was like, yeah, how do you highlight all the people we get the great food from? How do we highlight the people that are working in the back of the kitchen? How are we highlighting even, you know, the delivery, the catering, any of that to anybody, right? Um, it's a constant conversation and uh, it's a constant question that we still haven't completely answered. But I think that TSK is doing a good job in trying to model, you know, different practices and hopefully other restaurants are paying attention. And once that we're like completely open now past this pandemic, we can really like start to think about how are we doing that, right? How are we making our consumers conscious of what we're doing? Um, as a restaurant and then how are we getting the, the other restaurant industries to pay attention to the practices at TSK that make for a good stable work environment in a place that somebody wants to work because we offer you know great benefits great employees good pay all of that good stuff right sick leave and all these things that we consider I mean it's hard to compare us to other restaurants because we are a nonprofit, but I mean I think it's still totally possible there's just people unwilling to to they think it's going to break their company, right? They're going to go broke because they have to pay people low living wage. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, but I think we're doing a good job. And there's a couple of other people doing a great job out there. The shop is another one, very conscious of their employees who also like does things like that. Vinaigrette just switched to the no tipping policy as well, where they're just taking donations. I don't know what they do with those, but yeah. So those kind of things are happening. And so there's a little bit of a shift happening but it's not not enough yet not enough yet yeah i i think i think three sisters kitchen is a great model i think the um the community farms around town that actually that are actually supplying the csas um and then the fact that you can use snap benefits at csas and at farmers markets those are all really great and yet when I, when I visit a grower's market, I still don't see a ton of, um, you know, people like Chicano people or people of color, um, not, you know, folks who don't, you know, don't speak English or English isn't their first language. Like I still don't see a lot of that. So um, it's always just thinking through, you know, how do we let people know and how can we support it that, you know, there isn't like, my first line of work is in, in, in letting folks know about CSAs, but you know, how do we get that word out? How do we get that word out to our membership? Because Olay is a membership-based organization. So how do we do that better job of lifting that up? And then when it, you know, I, I think that supporting workers and the, the workers' rights and any chance you have to lend your voice to workers' rights, even if you already have those benefits yourself. Um, the more the more we hear from community and the more that we hear um, different voices who are saying, you know, yes, I support workers' rights and, you know, I already have benefits and I want those for everyone. When you hear that from multiple people, I think that also makes a really big impact. 
Can I ask a quick follow-up question to that? Amid sort of this national um, momentum of unionizing for food, like service workers and in particular food service workers, what does that conversation look like in New Mexico specifically? Um, so the United um, Food and Commercial Workers Union won new contracts in New Mexico. There were um, this now in the winter, there were, there were strikes happening in Colorado and Kansas. And so um, the UFCW union here um, went into pretty heavy contract negotiations. Um, so I don't know that the Starbucks uh, unionizing has happened in New Mexico yet, but the way the momentum is going, I can't see it not happening. What's really good about New Mexico is we are not a right to work state. So. Um, you know, the, the union busting that you see in other states, in right to work states, hasn't come to New Mexico. They've tried it, um, but it hasn't happened here. Um, so, I, you know, I and, and UFCW in particular with trying to pass paid sick leave, um, you know, was a really strong partner with all of our other organizations. And so, you know, um, I think it's really vital that we continue to support unions. And I think it's really vital that we support these newer unions that are coming up. Um, you know, the Amazon workers who won in New York, they weren't really, they weren't an affiliate of any kind of union. They just sort of did it on their own. And it's, that's exciting. Like, you know, um, I, I support our longtime really established unions and always know that there's room. It's a big tent, there's a lot of work to do. And so the fact that there's these new unions that are establishing and every day I feel like on Twitter, there's an announcement of a newly unionized Starbucks. Um, and it's it's an exciting time. And I think that, you know, we, we need to embrace it and be excited about it. And when it does come to New Mexico, um, you know, we need to turn out and support it in mass. And also recognizing that there is worker organizing already happening, you know, by Ole, by Somos Un Pueblo Unido, by El Centro de Igualdad y Derechos and Café. Like there is worker organizing happening in New Mexico, even if it isn't attached to labor. Um, and so I definitely want to also just lift up the work that's already happening because these big wins that we've had, like paid sick leave and minimum wage, came out of. Um, really large organizing, not just unions and not just community groups, but it, 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 it was a lift by all of us. I can just add a little onto that. Um, I think in terms of agriculture, some of the wins that we're looking towards and who's like doing it right is because there's not this federal you know, there's a federal exemption with ag. We're seeing states that are taking really direct action to protect farm workers. So Colorado last year passed the Farm Worker Act that eliminated the short-handled hoe um, that was offering um, minimum wage and sick time and limits on hours and things like that. And in New York as well. So we look forward to those kinds of laws passing state by state. Um, and then I'll also say that I take a lot of hope from the youth. Um, I think that they're redefining what farming, what a future of farming can be that's like rooted in, you know, nourishing each other and healing um, and collective care. So we see so many cooperatives, so many collectives starting up that is like really incredible in the way that they've imagined farming to be is, is truly sustainable. That does encompass like sustainability and harmony with the land, but also with each other, which I think is so inspiring. I think so much with agriculture, there's a lot of trauma and a lot of healing that needs to happen. Uh, oftentimes we see like farm owners who do exploit their workers, they do it and kind of justify it by saying, well, that's how I got through it. And that's how, what happened to me when I was a worker. And it's this like cycle of trauma that needs to stop. And I do see it happening um, and popping up here and there. And it's really, it's really inspiring. Wow. Well, on that inspiring note, um, I'd like to thank you so much again for joining us. This was an amazing conversation and definitely gives me hope for sort of the future of 
worker rights across the food industries. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you, uh, Bethany and the Humanities Council. Thank you. And um, this was such an enlightening conversation. I, uh, I so appreciate all of your uh, generosity and in your time today and giving us sharing with us your perspective. And I'm so glad that, uh, you know, we had agriculture and food industry and labor organizing um, it, uh, you all uh, interweave in really vital ways and, um, and that really was showing through in this conversation. So I appreciate that. Um, thank you, Three Sisters Kitchen. Thank you, Isha. And thank you, Divana, uh, for your tireless work uh, producing this series with me and um, information on Three Sisters Kitchen, on Olay, on Ashokra Farms uh, will all be detailed in the description of this video below. Um, and with that, thanks so much. <laughs>